Hey everybody, this is Dr. Emily Sterning with American Resiliency here with an up-to-date climate outlook for all of our friends in South Dakota. In the NCA4, South Dakota looked really strong. In the NCA5, we get to see the extent of that strength by the degree to which this report lavishes modeling resources on the region with a particular eye towards the Dakotas amidst the context of the overall strength of the Northern Great Plains. I wish, folks, that every section of the NCA5 was as wonderfully detailed as the section for the Northern Great Plains. I'm looking forward to walking through some unique, interesting, and positive figures with you today. I want to give you a little background for this update, though. You know, when I founded American Resiliency in 2021 and I started making these climate outlooks, I called them 2050 climate outlooks. Back then, it seemed reasonable to think we'd hit 2C at mid-century. That was the consensus science. But that was then. 2023, as you know, it was a very serious year in climate, and I want to show you about that. In this tweet from Professor Elliot Jacobson, we see this figure from the Copernicus Institute, which does a lot of Earth science measurements. They're based in Europe. We can see that in 2023, we went way off the baseline as far as global surface temperature. We can see that in 24, we're still way off. February, we were close to 1.8 C above pre-industrial baseline. So, you know, this evidence forces us to change our thinking. We can't be thinking about 2 C by 2050 anymore. We should be thinking about 2 C this summer. It's better to be safe than sorry. If there's perchance of projected extreme heat coming to your region, and there definitely is for the Northern Great Plains and the Northern Midwest, if you look back in our history to the Dust Bowl summers, to the summers of the 30s, we saw temperatures over 110 here before, and we need to be ready now for this summer to have a similar level of challenge. But safety warning over, back to the South Dakota outlook. If you wanna know where to find my source material, we're using the fifth national climate assessment. If you wanna follow along with any of the figures that I'm using, you can zoom in on them good. Go here, click at all figures. They'll all come up, they're all downloadable. They come into a nice zip file so that you can have them offline. I'm still using the fifth NCA because it represents the highest consensus climate science available. Your tax dollars paid for the development and review of this document. You deserve access. But as a matter of congressional mandate, there's no direct federal funding for communication to the public about the National Climate Assessment. This made me so mad I founded American Resiliency, the only nonprofit focused on communicating this important information to the public. We run on your donations. All right, let's look at a national overview for changes at 2C. All right, here in figure 1.14, we got a national overview at 2C. We see South Dakota in the moderate change band. We're expecting a total heat up for the state of four to five degrees F. Let's see where that's gonna fall seasonally though. We're gonna look at figure 2.11. Taking a big picture look, we do see some significant increase in days over 95 for South Dakota, for nights over 70, which is important for an agricultural region. And it looks like we're looking at maybe three weeks less of days below freezing. But let's get some more information. So here's figure 25.3, where we're looking at the first of these regional Northern Great Plains figure. And it looks like if we average it out, if we look at summer heat up, if we look at winter cold loss, you're looking kind of like Nebraska used to. You can see that that overlays pretty well, where South Dakota is picking up Nebraska's overall climate. And you know, we can get some yields in Nebraska. I think it's important for understanding the outlook for South Dakota to get focused in on cold loss. We're gonna go and look at plant hardiness zone shift in figure 11.3. Figure 11.3 is very large and hard to see. We're gonna look in a close-up side-by-side -side of present-day climate normals and the mid-century projection, the 2C projection. I feel like it's worth pointing out though that at 3C, you still have a pretty cold winter. There's a lot of longevity potential in South Dakota. Here we are zoomed in. This is the side-by-side -side clip of figure 11.3. South Dakota, as we all know, used to have a ferocious winter sticking in the fours, plant hardiness zone four. And if you look to the south of it, if you look at Nebraska's plant hardiness zones, we see that at 2C, you're pretty much hopping right up, pretty much hopping directly to a Nebraska winter, very similar also to a typical contemporary Nebraska summer coming up to South Dakota at 2C. This is a great classic ag outlook so far, but as we all know, it's dry in South Dakota. 
The importance of your water outlook is why the NCA5 is lavishing resources on you and why if you are in South Dakota now on some lousy land you've just been hanging on to and scrabbling on to and people offer you money for it, do not sell. Conditions are looking to improve pretty substantially in South Dakota. If you're there, you've been hanging out, you're scrabbling, you love the land, this is the outlook for you. This is the fortune coming for you. Let's check it out. Let's look at the water outlook now. For people who don't have a background to understand it, here's figure 25.2. This is how precipitation normally looks in the Northern Great Plains region. So looking at South Dakota, we're talking about here, you've got a lot of dry parts except for this dot of moisture towards the west and then towards the east, you've got sort of a water climb. Not a ton of precipitation, but notable climb with this exception in the state. That's your traditional precipitation shape. All right, so here we are in figure 210, projected U.S. precipitation changes at 1.5, 2, 3, and 4 C of global warming. You can see it too, we are expecting significantly more precipitation to hit South Dakota, particularly in the eastern climb where we're more accustomed to it. We see additional precipitation come in from the west at 3 C, and I'd like to point out that at 4 C, this little arm reaching from Iowa to southern Minnesota into South Dakota is the most stable region of the country to four. I think that this is a very special outlook. There's a lot of potential here in our prairie pothole region. Our land needs our love. There's a lot of potential for flourishment here. We got to bring it out. I think that it's reasonable under conditions of increasing water to have concern. Is it all going to come at once or not? So let's look over to figure 2.12 and get some insight as to where we're expecting extreme storms to increase in the region. So there's a lot going on in this figure, right? We can see that across models, you're expecting five to 10% more rain. We do expect storms to become more extreme. But if we zoom in on this five-year maximum daily precipitation, I feel like we see something that's very interesting and important for the region, which is that we do not expect significant deluge increases, particularly in this Eastern portion where we have the more normal rain climb of South Dakota, very similar to my highly conserved area in Eastern Iowa. We see this line of storms building on the Iowa-Minnesota border going to smash into Lake Michigan. We see that this dot that used to have a fair amount of water in a South Dakota is highlighted to have substantial increases in deluge type precipitation. So if you're out in this dry Western region, thinking about water capture for these high intensity rain events is gonna be an important part of your water story. And for the region, I think that thinking about the potential for water capture in this region that's gonna be seeing increased deluge type storms is very important. You know, talking about our prairie pothole region as a whole, and I know I'm getting kind of bioregional here, I'm not focusing enough on the state boundaries, but it's really exciting for us all. If we think about supporting water infrastructure in that region around the Minnesota-Iowa border to balance crop output and ecosystem needs, a lot of our nation's wild ducks, they start out as ducklings right in that area, right? That wet place looks like you could get more ducks out there. You could do more pothole intensification there, help recharge shallow aquifers, and have a healthy movement of some increased cropping in areas that are going to be getting more steady rain, less deluge type rain. It gives us a chance for balance within the bioregion to keep supplying both essential crops and wild ducks to North America. This is especially important if we look at figure 24.12, we've got a map of our U.S. aquifers. And we can see we don't have, you know, an especially deep aquifer spanning this region. So our care of surface water, of fairly shallow groundwater, is going to be really critical for our bioregional outcome. We've really got a shot here. We've really got a shot in this region. And understanding and caring for our regional water systems is the very heart of our good fortune here. And I want to get back to crops because it's time for the most exciting figures for people who love growing things. All right, so here, figure 25.5, we're looking at evapotranspiration. That's a measure of water going up from the ground. Change here is subtle. It's hard to interpret. We need to look at it in context of water availability because an increase in your evapotranspiration can mean more plants are growing. 
if you have a sudden sharp increase, like bam, it can mean you had a lot of plants die and you're watching the sign of their death. So let's look at changes in soil water availability to help us decide which is more likely that we're gonna get more plants growing in this region or we're gonna get a mass plant death in this region. Looking at figure 25.6, you can see here that across large parts of the state at 2C, we are not looking at serious decreases in soil moisture. In fact, we see some substantial productive increases. To me, if we overlay in our minds figure 25.5 and 25.6, we can see which parts of South Dakota potentially support more plant growth at 2C. That would be a large part of the state. In figure 25.8, we're able to take a look at the federally owned public and other protected lands. We've got reservation lands, a lot of reservation lands in South Dakota. I think that there's pretty decent overlay with that growth potential and the tribal lands. Say strong. I like this decent overlay, the growth potential, the protected lands, the tribal lands. I tell you, if you're like me and you have a dream in your heart of the prairie restored, these figures give me hope. You know, prairie doesn't come back overnight. Prairie takes a good five years to like get to adolescent stage where it can at least fight back a little bit. But we've got at least five years, I think. I mean, don't listen to anyone who tells you that we don't have time, that it's all lost, that it's time to give up. Why give up? You saw in those figures, prairie pothole region models to 4C. Let's have some fun. The potential is here for growth, for the carbon capture that actually works, which is prairie restoration. It's important to note the potential is also here in South Dakota for us to be turning out staple crops that Americans need. Finding the right path here, finding the sustainable path forward for our relationship with the land, we could keep the heart of America beating right here in the prairie pothole region and South Dakota you're such an important part of that story. I'm so happy to see this good fortune for you in the outlook. We are looking at incredible potential in South Dakota, but of course we also need to acknowledge the challenges. I mean, this isn't an outlook without change, right? We saw, in your feeling on the ground, substantial change. Changing into a Nebraska-like climate like overnight is not easy. I wanna show you here regionally. Let's look at figure 25.7. This figure is looking at your rapidly changing landscape through the lens of invasive species. If you look how quickly these invasive species are spreading over the landscape of your state, this just helps to give everyone who's not there on the ground feeling a change, a sense of how quickly things are going. Of course, when we see landscapes changing quickly, that should alert us to fire danger. Let's check that out in 7.4, the fire map. 7.4 is hard to read. You have to do math to read this map. This side of the map shows you the average number of days you had conditions for very large fire. So it was unusual. Once a decade, you'd have conditions for very large fire. If we come over here, the modeled regions of South Dakota, we see maybe a 300% increase in your fire conditions. So maybe every three years, maybe every two years, you could have the conditions right for a very large fire on the plane. That's a noteworthy increase in fire danger potential. And I hope we can also remember that there is no landscape that takes fire like a prairie. If you're also a prairie person, you know that fire is a critical tool in our work. We can accept fire, we can design for it, and we can work with fire here. It'll be interesting to think, how can we design communities as well as landscape to be friendly to fire in the prairie pothole region? And thinking about this sort of fire energy design stuff, I want to take a pick at one final figure, figure 5.2. So this is a figure about projected changes in electricity demand. As we move through the century, we're expecting everyone to need more energy. I think that it's worth noting, though, that South Dakota is in a very small club of states where we're probably not looking at too much difficulty meeting our local energy needs. Another important piece for the puzzle for the Prairie Pothole region. I think we can do it. As you can see, everybody in this little region has some unique strengths to contribute. I think it would be very convenient for everyone in this club to work together. I think we have just an enormous amount of potential. I know maybe I'm a little overexcited with this outlook, but it's so cool. And what else is so cool is being able to see that we've got potential for just this super team forming up in the region. You know, people from the outside think that it sucks here on account of how it's boring and there are so many ways that the weather will already kill you. And like that we're vulnerable to extreme heat to such a degree 
that you really got to kind of have a mole person part of your house where you can hide underground. It's our true. Trying to say that it's like life in uh, 1960s LA here in the Prairie Pothole region. But I don't know, folks. I love it here. And I love our potential. I see this serious potential for you, South Dakota. If you can care for the soil, if you can continue to do the great work you're doing right now on groundwater, South Dakota, you are in the beating heart of survivable territory, right in the heart of where we need to encourage biodiversity the most, right in the heart of where we have the potential to keep the heart of America beating. The, the government did not fund figures like this for other places. The government spent resources to identify your potential, and you need to hear about it. You need to realize this flourishment on the ground. You are the potential. Those of us on the ground in this region, we are the potential for the future. I'm giving you a big wave, South Dakota. The prairie is where the hope is at. Put your shoulder to the work and keep your ear to the ground. I see you all. Let's get ready together. Folks, thanks for watching and thanks for joining us. AR has recently passed a milestone. We've reached more than 100,000 people in America with detailed local climate information. And it's thanks to the incredible support of the AR community. There are so many folks committing their financial resources, their energy, their time to helping this information get out there. I'm so grateful to all of you. And I'm so glad that we're doing this together. Thanks for being there with me. I'm gonna keep an eye on the news. I'm gonna keep an eye on high consensus science. I'm gonna try and get you what you need as we go through this together.